And uh, uh, we left off uh, with the early uh, sound versions of uh, Murders in the Room Morgue. Well, now we're going to focus on uh, the Vincent Price, Roger Corman, uh, Poe collaborations. Uh, well, in the late 1950s, uh, American, uh, the American horror film is essentially stagnating uh, from an endless round of men in monster suits. Uh, in the late 50s, a uh, hammer film in uh, England uh, to revitalize the genre uh, goes back to classic figures, uh, Dracula, Frankenstein, the mummy. While Roger Corman, the uh, American producer slash director and uh, pioneer of grade uh, B to Z uh, budget sci-fi and horror films, goes back even further. He goes to Poe and he adds... Uh, uh, cinemascope and uh, an expressive use of color. Well, uh, the first film in the series, uh, the Poe series, the uh, Corman uh, Vincent Price Poe series, is The Fall of the House of Usher. That's 1960. Well, Corman picks Vincent Price because he's the ideal actor to represent his vision or uh, notion of Edgar Allan Poe's uh, intense. Uh, protagonist. He's the perfect choice. Uh, Price has a uh, rich, dramatic, often uh, ominous voice. Uh, he has a striking, strong uh, screen presence. And uh, Corman essentially gives Price uh, a grand opportunity to work himself up into a fine gothic torment or, uh, or a fit of cold-blooded cruelty. <laughs> Now, uh, Price gives a uh, magnificent performance. Uh, he's grand in manner and gesture, uh, yet uh, secretive and uh, physically sickening from inner corruption. Uh, this uh, illness, this corruption, is rooted in incestuous desire. And that incestuous desire communicates itself to the house, the house of Usher through uh, agitated camera angles that Corman uses. The result uh, of uh, their collaboration, this first collaboration between uh, Vincent Price and Roger Corman, was in fact a minor masterpiece uh, that has an eye for detail and uh, remains very faithful to Poe's original story. Now, Corman and Price, in fact, establish a new American Gothic cinema, because Usher, as I mentioned, is the first in a series of Poe, very atmospheric Poe films. Uh, they essentially have a formula. Uh, this formula revolves around uh, elegance, sensuality, uh, backlot expressionism, uh, claustrophobic corridors, uh, dust-laden selfishers, and decaying architecture. It's essentially an older brand of horror uh, that revolves around personality and dramatic finesse. Now, the second film in the uh, Corman uh, Price Poe cycle is The Pit and the Pendulum, 1961, that is conceived and executed in the same style. Now, this is, in fact, the film that uh, did it for me, that turned uh, me on to Edgar Allan Poe and Vincent Price and Roger Corman. I was all of seven years old, uh, when I saw this film on television, uh, it's a great movie. I highly recommend you see this. Uh, the sexual motif in the film is beautifully worked out. It's uh, confusions of guilt. Uh, Price identifies his wife, Barbara Steele, who has the most riveting black eyes ever put on screen. Uh, he, he identifies Steele uh, as his mother. And during the course of the film, he begins to turn into his father. Now, Price is noticeably more extravagant, and he's matched by Corman in a greater fluidity of camera movement. Uh, there's memorable sequences. Uh, uh, for example, uh, Steele allures Price down to the crypt. Uh, the finale, with Price tumbling into the pit, and uh, steel sealed into an Iron Maiden is simply unforgettable. It's a great movie, an awful lot of fun. Now, the third film in the series is The Premature Burial. Now, there's no Vincent Price this time. It's actually Ray Milland. 
And uh, the third film is the weakest film in the post cycle. Uh, Corman relies too heavily on uh, gloomy graveyards, uh, gothic mansions, swirling fog, uh, bats, spider webs, that kind of thing. Uh, the best sequence in the film uh, is the uh, hallucinatory vision uh, of being buried alive. Uh, the screen goes dark. Uh, the soundtrack registers only the pounding of Ray Milland's heartbeat. Now, Ray Milland was a great actor, and uh, he did an awful lot of great work. But he's wrong for this movie. For one thing, he's playing a young medical student when he's in his 50s, and he doesn't quite pull it off. The film does have some charming moments, and, uh, it, al and it also has Hazel Court's uh, hourglass figure, which is always an asset. Now, let's move on to the next film, Tales of Terror. This is 1962. This is three stories, three post stories, with Vincent Price starring in each episode. Uh, he's partnered with uh, Peter Laurie and Basil Rathbone. Well, the first uh, story, the first segment in the film, is uh, Morella, which is essentially perfection. Uh, it's done with great effectiveness and great delicacy. Now, for those of you who don't know the story of Morella, a young woman, uh, embittered uh, and dying, returns home, uh, having been banished uh, when her mother dies, giving birth to her. Now, she returns home and she finds her father, a lonely alcoholic, brooding over the mummified body of his wife. This incest motif, this triangular web of love and hate, echoes Usher. And this uh, love-hate relationship between the father and the daughter conjures up the dead woman's spirit. Now, the second episode in the film is the Black Cat. This is Peter Lorre's moment to shine. He is absolutely terrific in this film. He has a vein of sardonic humor. Uh, there's drunken hallucinations and uh, uh, maniacally funny rages. Uh, Lorre was seldom, if ever, better. He is absolutely great in this movie. And the third segment, the facts of the case of Mr. Valdeman, well, it's wonderfully ghoulish with a fine performance by Rathbone as the scheming mesmerist. All right, let's move on to the next film. As I mentioned, there's moments of uh, sardonic humor in uh, Tales of Terror. Well, they uh, play up the humor even more in the fifth film in the uh, Poe cycle called The Raven. This is 1963. Now, this movie is essentially an excuse uh, to assemble Vincent Price, Boris Karloff, and Peter Lorre in the same movie. Now, they play uh, a riotous trio of magicians, and uh, self-parody is the name of the game in this film. Uh, the wit keeps flowing nonstop. This film also has uh, Hazel Court in it, and uh, that is, once again, A+. plus. Now, uh, the final uh, duel of the Wizards uh, is uh, very imaginatively staged, and uh, the film also features a very young Jack Nicholson in a supporting role. All right, let's move on to the sixth film, The Mask of the Red Death, 1964. This is the most ambitious and the best of the Corman uh, Poe cycle. This is a great movie. It is a masterpiece. Vincent Price as Prospero was never better. He's a devil-worshipping, sadistic, uh, sadistic ruler. Uh, and he brings revelry and uh, cruelty to a high art. Uh, there's a brilliant, sharp, clear use of color. And there's exquisitely wrought sets and costumes. Great production values on a very modest budget that dazzle the eye. Uh, there's sudden color changes from white to yellow to purple to black. And the film is graced with uh, an uncommonly intelligent script that probes the concept of diabolism uh, with considerable subtlety. Uh, the film is, in fact, a type of spiritual fable. It features intellectual chills, uh, not to mention amazing photography by future... Uh, uh, director Nicholas Rowe. Now, Price, uh, 
in the film has a genuine philosophical curiosity. Uh, the film tackles unknown territories of the mind and soul. Uh, to uh, Price, to Prospero, good and evil are ideas or concepts that uh, are to be tested, uh, perhaps found wanting. Uh, this film is highly influenced by Ingemar Bergman's The Seventh Seal, uh, 1956, uh, in its intellectual probings, uh, its figuration of death, and its conception of the final sequence, The Dance of Death. All right, uh, let's move on to the last entry in the uh, Corman Vincent Price Poe cycle, The Tomb of Lygia, 1965, which is basically uh, a necrophilic obsession. Uh, Price lurks behind dark glasses in this film and uh, walks around the vastness of his gloomy Gothic Abbey home, uh, dreading possession of his second wife by the restless spirit of his first. It's essentially Poe filtered through the Gothic melodrama Jane Eyre. Uh, his eyes, uh, Vincent Price's eyes, are crucial to the film's vision. Uh, what he sees, how he sees it, is very important to the film. Uh, basically, he blinds himself to the truth until he's tempted to pry into the mysteries that are going on. This new marriage, this new love that he has, gives the dead spirit of Lygia the foothold that she needs for a vengeful return. Now, uh, Corman uh, hangs it up. Uh, as a director, uh, shortly after this film, uh, he makes uh, a handful of other movies. But in 1970, he stops directing to focus on production. But Vincent Price continues the post cycle without Corman in a trio of films shot in England. Uh, the first one is The Conqueror Worm, 1968, which is directed by Michael Reeves. This is an excellent, often gruesome movie about witch hunting in England that gives Price one of his best roles. It's a master performance of cultivated villainy. Uh, Price in this film is a black-robed figure, a uh, cynically religious maniac who takes advantage of the social dislocation of the English Civil War. Uh, he showcases uh, cold-blooded viciousness and pathological cruelty. It's one of his greatest performances. Torture, degradation, inflicted by the witch finder in this film is reflective, symbolic. Evil pervades the social fabric itself. It's deeply ingrained and has become an accepted part of, uh, of daily living. The film has great atmosphere, a uh, muted intensity of death and decay. Now, he, uh, he made two other Poe films in England, uh, The Oblong Box, 1969, which uh, features Christopher Lee, and The Cry of the Banshee, 1970. These are lesser films. They're, they're not up to the others, but uh, they certainly have their moments, and uh, they're worth a look. So uh, if you can, go check out these... Uh, Vincent Price, Roger Corman collaborations because they are truly remarkable films that have uh, held up much better than many of the big budget extravaganzas from the era.